Hello and welcome to the Change Fail Podcast with Kevin Brennan and Julian Sammy. Today is episode three. Uh, event three. Well, let's just call it Marvelous Failures on June 6th, 2016. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Julian. So I want to jump right in. Captain America and Tony Stark are both colossal failures when it comes to teamwork. And what makes you say that? Um, did you see what they did to their team? <laughs> Just in case anybody somehow missed this, we're talking about Captain America Civil War. <laughs> now, I think at this point, if you haven't seen these movies, you should know there will be spoilers. Yeah, I, I would hope that people have figured that out by now, but you know how people do get. Yes. And yes, um... They di- it didn't exactly leave it in good shape after that whole series of events, did they? Well, it's not just Civil War. I mean, you started to see the, the leadership failures as far back as the, the first Avengers movie and um, moving through Age of Ultron and, and then finally in Captain America's Civil War. Um, you see these two guys who are both ostensibly excellent leaders who somehow go out of their way to really destroy the teams that that are supposed to be supporting them. And it relates to having a common enemy being a very different motivator than having a common cause. The best they ever get to is having a common enemy. And when they don't have that, they they have a disaster. So, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. And certainly if you look at the first Avengers movie, right... They come together, essentially, to stop an alien race from invading New York. But, you know, in that movie, they all work together very effectively. And then the next time we see them together as a group, we see them in Age of Ultron. And here we have a case where one of the key people who is the leader of the team, Tony Stark, is off doing his own thing that actually has pretty significant implications for the Avengers as a team. And hasn't told anybody except Bruce Banner that he's even thinking about this. To be fair, in the opening scene, while they're uh, in that nice big battle, they, they do work together very, very well. The, the dialogue even feels like the kind of conversation you get with a team of people who have been working together a long time in an office. But it starts to fall apart very quickly when Tony sees this opportunity to maybe do something that he's dreamed about. I think he thinks it's risk analysis and and risk avoidance, but everybody else would see it as as being based in fear. You know, when uh, Tony convinces Bruce that he should be putting armor around the world, they don't go to the rest of the team because, as uh, Tony says, he doesn't want the men must not meddle medley that discussion probably would have uh, eliminated the entire Ultron initiative. So I can understand him, you know, not wanting to be constrained, but that's because, you know, I don't think he was ever a team player. He was just sometimes on the same side, or at least against the same enemy. And that's where the fundamental conflict between Tony Stark and Steve Rogers is rooted, right? Steve is at the opposite end, where he trusts his team, but he doesn't trust the government to make the right decisions, which leads to his actions in civil war, whereas Tony feels that the team are as much of a threat to humanity, potentially, as everything else. But the real threat is that, you know, suddenly there are all of these things which are more than and bigger than human, and humanity has to have a way to deal with that and protect itself against that. The challenge, of course, and the reason why we're talking about this podcast is that it's a fictional situation, obviously. It's not entirely realistic because it involves aliens and gods and all of this stuff, but the dynamics are certainly something that you see in a lot of business situations where you have two people with very strong opinions who both have the respect of a lot of their teammates and who are both convinced that the other person's position is not only wrong, but potentially disastrous. And when those two get into conflict, they they polarize everyone around them. 
because they do both have valid, like morally defensible positions um, and plans and ideas that, you know, anyone could look at and say, I don't agree with you, but I can see where you're coming from. At least potentially you could say that. You know, I, I took a step back to look at what motivates these guys in terms of loss and gain. Where I came out on it is that Tony is primarily motivated by avoiding loss. Goes right back to his childhood, avoiding the loss of his parents, which he couldn't do. So he, you know, invests hundreds of millions of dollars in inventing a pair of funky glasses that allow him to relive that experience in a way that was, you know, how he wished it could have been. And uh, his, he has a terrible fear of harm to his loved ones, probably rooted in that. And for personal safety, I mean, the man built a suit of armor. So, you know, he's not in it because he's a risk taker. He's in it because he's trying to avoid those risks. And on the other side, there's only a few things that he really cares about in terms of what, what he wants to gain. Demonstrating his personal brilliance and to invent or create. And other than that, I don't see any real big uh, motivations for him. There's an interesting turnaround in his position over the course of the movies, right? In Iron Man 2, he's saying, you know, why would I turn this st stuff I built over to the government? How can I trust you guys? And now feels that the gov governments are the only group that can really be trusted to handle the kind of power that the Avengers have available to them. Well, I think that comes back to harm to loved ones. He has gone from seeing extrinsic threats as being the most dangerous thing to seeing himself as being the most dangerous thing. I mean, the man inv invented Ultron. He didn't mean to make Ultron. He didn't mean to drop a city, um, you know, out of the sky. But he did that. And he's right that he's dangerous. Right, and even before that, we have the first movie where you have the Tory invasion, and that, too, is after Iron Man 2, right? So up until that point, it's really been him with his cool suit, you know, doing whatever he feels is right to handle normal level threats for the most part, maybe people at his level, and now he's gone to seeing threats that are well beyond what he had ever been able to envision, and that's made him scared. On the flip side... Steve Rogers trusts his own judgment far more than anybody else's. And we see that, for instance, in his reaction to the Sokovia Accords. And again, from his experience, he's just come out of seeing uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. turn out to be Hydra, his enemy from World War II. And so, yeah. you know, he knows that the government is penetrated and compromised. And so from his perspective... Hey, yes, there are all these bad things that happen, but we handled them, and we know we can continue to handle them, and we don't know what these other people's motives are. Gap is motivated by teamwork and trust. Um, he wants to do his part and honor and integrity. Like, those are the things that he cares about. What I think he fears is a loss of teamwork and trust. Like, that's, that's a motivator on both sides. He desires it, and he fears its loss. He is afraid of losing personal freedom, not just for him, but for everyone. And his distrust, as you say, of the government is well-founded in, in S.H.I.E.L.D. and HYDRA and in Nazi Germany. I think he's still staying true to those motivations. Cap goes from being someone who really does want to do the right thing within the structure that exists to wanting to do the right thing without having a structure to impede his ability to do that. A way to think about this is I think Steve Rogers is very much a bottom-up thinker. He's, he's not a systems thinker. He recognizes that there's a big picture, but he's, he doesn't care about the big picture. He cares about What's going on with Bucky today? What's going on with my team right now? As opposed to Stark. Yeah, because Tony also wants to do what he sees as the right thing. But to him, that means putting a check on the Avengers, getting them under control, and not trusting them and not working with them so much as 
here are the accords and we have to obey them. And I will take steps to make sure that we obey them. I think he is coming at it from the top down and seeing, you know, if this is all a jigsaw puzzle, Cap cares about individual pieces and Tony cares about the picture. And if a few pieces get dropped along the way, you can still have a beautiful picture or at least a puzzle that doesn't just disintegrate. And those two ideological frameworks come in conflict. So, okay, this is all very interesting. And it led them to a colossal set of failures. Now, the big failure is, of course, that the Avengers are destroyed. I mean, they split into two teams, and the reason it's called Civil War is that the Avengers end up quite literally battling it out in a very exciting scene. I had quite a lot of fun, actually. But the, the underlying cause for this is actually uh, a bad guy named Zemo. And he is an example of resiliency in the face of change failure. And he is successful because he is also a character who has defensible or at least understandable motivations, revenge in this case. And he goes through systematically and develops plans with layers of resiliency. The first part of the movie is Zemo's plans being thwarted. In that scene where he is asking for the mission report for 1991. Yeah, that's the one where he gathers the evidence that uh, Bucky was, spoiler alert, responsible for the death of Tony Stark's parents. What he says in that scene is, tell me what I want to know, because otherwise I will have to use much more bloody means to achieve what I want to achieve. His original plan is not to blow up the UN. His original plan was something else entirely. What he cared about was getting the video evidence and then creating a scenario where Cap and Tony would be at odds with one another. And he was thwarted, but he had a backup plan and he had other ideas about ways that he could take advantage of the weaknesses in his enemies. Or, you know, in a business sense, in the uh, weaknesses in competitors. So that takes us around to, you know, the reason we picked on this particular set of films, not just because we're geeks, but because over the course of several movies, you get to see how these interpersonal dynamics play out into the collapse of what was at one point a very effective, high-performing team. And it comes down to, you know, fundamental fractures that the team is basically unable to address. So, I mean, Julian, let me ask you a question. Do you think there was a point where Tony and Cap could have walked it back earlier? Is there a different approach that they could have taken to some of these fundamental issues that would have helped keep the team together and not working at odds? So yes and no. I think there was a point way back when you know, the Avengers really were first forming, or at least right after they had, they had uh, saved the world, where they could have organized themselves to be um, two teams, really, with a common goal of protecting the world, but on the one side, working from Cap's point of view, and the other side working from Tony's point of view. And as those points of views changed, they should have been having a conversation about what their goals are. And I don't think any of them really ever recognized what was motivating them. So instead of having a bond of trust between team members where they could say, uh, I disagree with you, but I know your motives are good and let's work out some way to not be at odds with one another, they could have done that, but they didn't. And, you know, Tony, when Tony saw himself as a threat, he should have said, I need to be put in check. And he tried to have that conversation way too late. Right, and so what he ended up doing 
and you see this is a pattern in his management style, if you will, is that he presents a set of fait accomplis, right? It's like, oh, I built Ultron. Oh, we've negotiated these Sokovia Accords and you need to sign them. He keeps doing that because he probably feels that he's the only one smart enough to really see the problem, right? Like Captain America and Black Widow are out there. And yeah, they're great people, but, you know, they're, they're these low-level tactical people. And, I, you know, I, I and maybe Bruce are the only ones who can really see the big picture here. You know, he's not wrong um, that he is smarter than, than basically everybody. But he and he's also uh, motivated to to present solutions. I mean, he builds things, and you don't present half a toaster. You present a working final product. So his kind of iteration is not like not what normal people would consider to be any kind of a development cycle. And that leads to all kinds of problems, because when people are not engaged in the process of change, then they get surprised, and surprise and fear and resistance go together. Right. You know, so when he comes into the team and says, here are these accords, we need to sign them, you have some team members who sit there and say, you know what, I agree, there's, there's, a, big, there's a big problem here, we... You know, not that we meant to, but we destroyed an entire city in the last movie, right? Uh, dropped it from the sky to the ground. Who knows how many people were killed? That's bad. And so you have people like Black Widow and others who are immediately on board, more or less, with the idea of some level of restriction. But you also have a set of team members uh, who have never been through that process of saying, you know what, this is something we need. And so they're presented with a solution to something that they don't even agree is a problem. Especially Steve. And in fact, he would say that the Accords are a much bigger problem and a much larger threat than alien invaders would be. Because, you know, we can marshal forces to defend this world. I'm uh, reminded of a scene in the, the Battlestar Galactica series from a few years back where the military are conscripted into acting as police. And uh, the Admiral says, there's a reason why you don't use soldiers to police your people, because then the population starts to look like enemies. The Avengers are best suited to external threats. They're not well suited to any sort of internal police kind of functioning. They, they should be a, well, a shield between humanity and humanity's enemies, not trying to take care of individuals or even populations of people, not to protect them from themselves. Yeah, and, you know, if you want to get into it, you could also talk about things like the differing power level of different Avengers also probably shapes that. I mean, if you're Steve Rogers, it's a little unpersuasive to argue that you could be a world-destroying threat because he's a incredibly fit person at the top of human potential, but he's just a guy, right? He's not bulletproof, you know, except for that shield. Um, he's not, you know, but the point is that he, Captain America is unlikely to be able to, you know, walk in and destroy an entire nation, whereas Tony Stark has, you know, can build, an, can build Ultron. and. Right. You know, or the vision, or these. So there is that disparity, which also is part of it. But you know, I don't think it's fundamental to what we're talking about here. I think much more fundamental is that you know there was no effort made to prepare the Avengers for a change. Tony just assumed that everybody would see the work, the situation the way he does. I I don't think he assumed they would see it his way. I think that they would come around. He thought they would come around, and that. It was worth breaking a few eggs uh, to to put that kind of accord in place to control or put enough regulation on what they could do so that they could be effective without shouldering the responsibility for all of their actions all the time. And, you know, I think he was right. Some of them did. Uh, but, you know, he was also right that some of them absolutely could not. 
perhaps the weakest scene in the whole movie for me was when he's trying to convince Steve to sign the accords and he's got FDR's pens and so on. And Steve wigs out about Scarlet Witch being confined to the the Avengers campus. I don't know that Captain America would have just gone off like that. And on, on something as small as uh, asking someone who just killed a bunch of people by mistake to maybe stay out of the public eye for a little while. Yeah. But but I think, you know, at the same time, that that points to how deeply divided they were in the first place. And until, you know, they found a common enemy again, Zemo, they were unable to work together. They worked together very briefly, and then, of course, Zemo drives that final wedge in with his endgame and drives them apart. And... Ironically, of course, the final divider is something where Steve has acted like Tony did with everything else, where he's decided that people don't need to know something. And in his case, for, for selfish reasons, because he knows how Tony will react. And so he just feels it's better for him not to know the truth. I, I think it's an honest error of judgment in that if Tony knew about Bucky and about the circumstances of his parents' death, it likely would not have brought him any peace and probably would have brought him more pain, certainly in the short term, possibly in the long term, and set Tony off on a whole new quest against someone that uh, that Steve cares about. Now, if Steve had come to, to Tony and said, listen, I discovered something a while back, I haven't told you about it because it's going to cause us problems and I need your help to solve that without anybody getting killed. Without vengeance, despite being called the Avengers. Now, if Steve had approached that calmly with a cocktail, you know, had a, had a party or whatever, um, I think that they could have had a conversation about the Winter Soldier and about what Steve knew, and Steve could have be could have approached that with some humility, and admitting that he he was wrong and that he shouldn't have held this back, but also said, "I've realized that I was wrong, and I'm sorry, and I and I want to help you, and I want you to help me to bring him in and repair him because he has been broken," which would have. You know, put it in a context where it's Tony could have seen this as a problem to be solved that would also help him solve some of his own, you know, inter, uh, internal issues around his parents' death. And the way they played it, it's fairly clear that Steve realizes that he's, he's screwed this up big time, that he should not have held it back to be revealed in the way it was because, of course... That's when Tony completely loses it, and we get the, that final battle between them that kind of irre irrevocably shatters the Avengers as a team. Well, so I disagree. Until they get back together in a future movie, blah, 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 blah. Well, yeah, and that's why I disagree, because I think we come full circle here back to why the Avengers were a team ever. And it's when there's a common threat. And in fact, that's one of the last lines in the first movie. You know, how will we, uh, how will we call them? And, and uh, Nick Fury says, you know, they'll, they'll come together when we need them to. And that's exactly what I think will happen when, when there's a big enough threat, an existential threat that the Avengers feel that they can deal with, then they'll set aside everything else because there is you know there's there's a fire and we're in it and i don't care if you have daddy issues it's not relevant right now and we can concentrate on you know not burning to death right but in the meantime what we see is that problem we talked about at the beginning so a team that was kind of united by a common problem fractures once that problem goes away or a new problem takes the forefront because for whatever reason they aren't able to work through that change in their situations 
So let's give some advice. Uh, if you're an executive or a senior manager, uh, you are working in a team, people who are roughly your power level, and also working with people who have significantly more power than you and significantly less. Sounds like a heterogeneous team, a lot like the Avengers. Ideally, you will be doing two things together. You will be avoiding the same kind of loss and seeking the same kind of gain. Now, what I mean is, if your organization actually has a strategy and is trying to follow it, there should be a clear and present danger or set of risks that everybody is working to avoid. Now, how you avoid those things, that could potentially be up to the discretion of individual managers. There should also be a place that everyone is trying to get to. Because it's not enough to run away from the fire. You need to have a destination in mind or people will end up working at cross purposes and the team will start to fragment and, sh and ultimately shatter. It was a Toyota that, that had their strategy was basically beat Honda? Or was it the other way around? I think it may have been the other way around. But so that was a pretty clear and simple direction. And... They also had a pretty clear and simple uh, position that they were trying to avoid. And it allowed them to marshal resources across the organization in unexpected ways. But when those pr unifying purposes start to fall apart, you can then see organizations get locked up in complicated internal battles. And one I remember reading about recently was actually Disney in the last years of Michael Eisner's term there. You know, there had been, while they had been successful for a long time, they'd been doing a lot of growth, but they ran into fundamental conflicts over purpose, among many other things. One of those was, you know, is Disney a family-oriented brand, or do we look to expand into other areas of entertainment? That fundamental disagreement on purpose led to a crack up of, of the board's sense of unity. Um, there were a lot of other factors, like the number of the board members being too close to the management of the organization um, and dependent on the management for a fair bit of their income, things like that. But the end result was after a while, things became toxic at senior management levels. You know, I don't know how it is today, but it was fascinating to read about how that conflict grew and entrenched itself over time and in many ways how it could it could have been avoided except that egos got in the way and people were too convinced that they were right in order to actually step back and say okay well what are the real issues here there's a, a dangerous and perhaps intractable problem to be an effective leader one must be confident if you're not confident in yourself People will not be confident in you. They will not follow you. Ergo, confidence is necessary for leadership. If you are too confident, then when you are wrong, and it will occur, it is very difficult to break through that ego. I mean, there's a reason why courts had gestures. Yeah. Someone with uh, authority to speak truth to power with immunity. I think this may be a theme for avoiding failure, as opposed to achieving success, you need to seek out those things that will cause you to fail. One, one thing you can do individually, set your own metrics for what does a success look like and what does a failure look like, something that uh, you're looking to improve. You can start to see trends that you would otherwise never be able to see. And the value of writing it down is that you actually have something to look back on because if you just rely on your memory you're going to remember the things that confirm your own self-image so you'll you'll certainly remember when you were right and everyone else was wrong you won't remember so much the times when you were wrong and others were right yeah, confirmation bias yeah one way i've heard it expressed is that a leader needs to have strong opinions but weakly held opinions which is to say you need to be solid with the courage of your convictions and the direction you want to go but you also need to be actively, openly looking for evidence that would prove that your opinions about the direction of your industry or your organization are invalid. So 
it's important to take a systems view, a Tony Stark view of how the uh, the things that you are measuring and the things you are examining uh, will affect not only you but affect the whole system. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, and you know, to bring it back to our original topic, I, I'm pretty certain that Tony Stark did not do that in terms of his modeling of behaviors and responses and all those sorts of things during the course of Civil War. Definitely not. I think Zemo did. Yeah, that's the case where, you know, unlike a lot of the real world situations where this kind of thing happens, you know, you actually had somebody who was plotting at length and knew the personalities in enough detail to figure out what would each of them have as a breaking point. So I think that uh, in Zemo's original plan, the primary motivation was simply to fracture Steve and Tony. No one else really mattered because they were the leaders and the people who with the most strongly held positions and everyone else was collateral damage. He really did look at the, the motivations very carefully and worked at that level instead of trying to work at the, you know, how hard can you punch or what can you build level. He was worried about their powers. He was worried about their humanity. And I think that's a good lesson for anyone who's trying to get something done. The challenge there is, you know, for all of them is to understand that the motives of the team, people on the team are not necessarily the motives of the people who see themselves as leading the team. Uh, this comes back to the confidence, right? Tony also trusts his own judgment more than he trusts the judgment of anyone else. And in his judgment, he shouldn't be trusted. <laughs> That's very security. I love recursion. So, uh, I guess the, the big lesson here is, as you said so uh, succinctly, hold strong opinions, hold them lightly. And when you do that, you have a much better chance of being much more successful. You know, be careful in those situations where if you're a leader, you think, well, oh, it's okay if we break a few eggs, if all the team doesn't come on board. Because if, if you take that attitude, you may end up breaking the team far more thoroughly than you expect. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, you said, be careful. You didn't say, don't break eggs. It can be necessary. There, there can be situations where, you know, the survival of your organization or something else is at stake and you have to go in a new direction but if you do that you know take the time to understand the genuine objections that your team may have you know is it possible that the accords could have been modified in ways that got steve to be more comfortable with it in a real world equivalent then yes maybe there is something that could have found a workable middle ground between those two sides and if not, it would have at least kept a greater section of the team together to understand where the objections were coming from, why they were there, and what fears and concerns the other members of the team had, rather than Tony simply walking in with a 900-page document and essentially saying, sign this or get out of superheroing. Yeah. If you don't sign this, retire. Yeah. So... Yeah, I think I think that there probably was middle ground that would have been possible if, if, if. And I think on that note, we should ask everyone to go to change.fail. That's http colon slash slash change.fail, not change.fail.com. Download the show notes, take a look, comment, listen to this one and previous ones. And you can find us on iTunes at change.fail podcast. Nice chatting with you, Kevin, as always. Yeah. Good talking to you, Julian.